everybody, Son Goshoku here, and welcome to this review for NXT TakeOver Chicago 2. But first, make sure to hit that subscribe button followed by hitting the notification bell so that way you are notified as soon as my content is released. You know guys, this is my second NXT show that I've gone to live in person, which came from Rosemont, Illinois, but of course they will bill it as Chicago. And just one of the things that I always love about going to an NXT show is it just feels like the fans are there to sort of, you know, enjoy the show because of the product, the, the fans, and they're definitely like 100% invested into the match and the characters on NXT and the shows, whereas, as you will see uh, with Money in the Bank, they are, you know, a little bit more concerned about, they're more concerned, obviously, about hijacking the show, uh, and honestly, when you look at the way the WWE product's main roster is built, can't really blame them now, can you? <laughs> but um, I also want to say uh, it was really cool before the show uh, in line got to meet from NoDQ.com and Aaron Riff, Virtue, and Stefan Osborne. I've been a huge fan of NoDQ and following their website and YouTube since 2009, so it was a true honor as well as hanging with them during the NoDQ meetup the following day. Um, and there's some videos that we got up of it and everything, uh, <laughs> cutting promos and all that stuff, so you can see all those on NoDQ.com, social media sites, and links, of course, will be in the description below. With that said in mind, guys, here I will give you the in because I haven't watched it all, I haven't watched it back yet on the network, so I'll be giving you the live perspective of being there for NXT TakeOver Chicago 2. So let's begin with the very first match, the NXT Tag Team Championship match, as Danny Burch and Oni Lorcan took on the Undisputed Era, represented by Kyle O'Reilly and Roderick Strong. Just a little disclaimer here, guys, I do not keep up with the weekly NXT programming. I watch it every now, here and there, uh, but the video package do a very great job of breaking this down. Um, this opening match was incredible. Being there live, I can tell you the crowd was red hot. This match was like so much better than I, I think most people thought because a lot of hype going into this match was for the Velveteen Dream and Ricochet, formerly known as Prince Pumba. So there's a lot of great action in this match, but one of the interesting things I will say was the crowd reaction here because you have the Undisputed Era who are clearly the heels and then you've got Lurkin and Birch who are obviously the baby faces and the fans were booing them there's one point in the match where Adam Cole baby ended up getting ejected from the ring from interfering and the crowd reigned in the Booze, you would have thought Roman Reigns interfered in this match, seriously. Um, so, yeah, that's one of those things where, you know, these guys are heels, but uh, the fans love them so much. You know, I think there's just there's so much, you know, obviously a lot of fans have a great respect for where these guys came from. And then on top of that, you know, it's just, you know, especially saying the Adam Cole, baby, it's, you know, it's just really cool stuff. Um, which is, I think, the opposite of what we got from Tommaso Ciampa uh, later on in the match event but uh yeah nonetheless though things really did come around towards the later part of the match like the fans were really getting into it and uh they definitely started to you know cheer more on Birch and um and Lorcan and everything about that uh in the match and uh there was a point where they almost got the double submissions and there were so many near falls towards the end so definitely if you haven't seen the match definitely go ahead and check it out uh at the end though we even got to see like a doomsday uh type move once again I'm sorry if I don't know the the actual name or like I said, I don't really watch the NXT uh, shows uh, weekly. Uh, but yeah, the match ended uh, after several reversals. Um, Undisputed Era did pick up the win uh, doing some sort of combination of, uh, of a leg whip and clothesline and all that stuff like that. Um, and Undisputed Era walks, walks away with the tag titles. So definitely check out. It was a really hot opener. And when the first match is this good and you got several more matches to go, you know it's going to be a a good night and uh oh yeah everybody got a standing ovation i can tell you myself included i was up there standing ovation uh hats off to all four of these guys 
Alright, so let's move on to the next match, which I know a lot of people feel was the match of the night. And hey, you are not getting any argument out of me. Even though I do think the main event was the match of the night, uh, I, you can't go wrong with this match. And that is Ricochet versus the Velveteen Dream. Um, so, this, uh, you know, the build-up was, was pretty cool. I did see the uh, cool part where... Uh, you know, uh, Ricochet ended up doing the flip uh, right onto his legs from in the ring outside and went all up into uh, into Velveteen Dream's face and, you know, challenged him to, like, prove that he can do anything uh, that Ricochet could. So, obviously, this was really cool, simple, uh, simple, you know, straight-to-the-point stuff that was really good for the build-up. Then you had Velveteen Dream, who I admit I wasn't a big fan of the gimmick uh, at first, and but I enjoyed that Velveteen Dream that are Patrick Clark who I remembered on uh, Tough Enough I was very glad that he ended up getting uh, to showcase himself here on the uh, NXT product and has gotten so over with the fans and uh, he came out dressed as Hulk Hogan and I, I like I said I think it's tremendous what he's been able to now do with this gimmick and how over he's been able to get, get this you know I can just tell from the passion he had on Tough Enough that you know this guy is going places and it looks like it is you got freaking John Cena out here uh, saying he would want to challenge the Velveteen Dream um, so yeah man you know that's a huge cop that's gotta be a huge compliment for him uh, that being said uh, Velveteen Dream came out dressed as Hulk Hogan brother what's raised that the Hulkster might be coming back dude <laughs> no I'm just kidding Please forgive the uh, Hulk Hogan impression um, who knows uh, I would like to see Hulk Hogan and WWE make peace so uh, yeah that could be uh, very well the um, the case here and you had ricochet who came out and uh you know he did a huge jump into the ring uh you know it was very superstar like a like a superhero very heroic like and uh the match was really good uh you had a lot of storytelling and that's what it was like and i think that's what i really do enjoy about the velvet team dreams the the storytelling uh that you get in these matches so that's really good which is very critical uh with the style of matches that wwe uh you know should Shows. And if they can hook you in with a great story in that ring, then you've got those, you've got the crowd, right? Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of cool spots in this match. Uh, there's one point where uh, that you know was very a lot of back and forth action. You had a lot of great high flying, high flying spots, and there's a point where both men were actually on the ground and uh, everybody's chanting, uh, you know, the count, which is very interesting. Like I said, the crowd here. I noticed that the NXT crowd, everyone chanted along, one, two, three, you know, all for the 10 counts, whereas at Money in the Bank, everybody was chanting 10, 10, 10, <laughs> um, but um, I even yelled out, they're gonna go ahead and give us the Nakamura and AJ Styles finish, <laughs> it looked like that way for a while, but um, yeah, we, we didn't end up getting that, uh, there was another cool spot where where Ricochet went for the 450 splash and landed right on the Velveteen's knees, who got the knees up to block it. Um, and, you know, like anything you can do, I can do better. So the Velveteen Dream uh, goes for his elbow off the top rope, which I think it was called the, um, was it called the, the Purple Rainmaker, I think? Uh, he goes for that and misses. And then from there, Ricochet goes up and nails the 630 splash to pick up the win uh like I said, what hasn't been said about this match that it hasn't that hasn't been said by everyone? This was great. Uh, both guys looked really strong. Um, but I will say, hopefully, the next time um, they put Velveteen Dream on a takeover show, hopefully he walks away with the win because it's 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 gonna be cool. But you you don't want to get to that point where I felt like they got with Bray Wyatt because I know a lot of you out there, myself included, are big fans of Bray Wyatt but they kept booking Bray Wyatt and all these big matches and he kept losing 
and it just kind of started coming off to where the Bray Wyatt character does a lot of talking, but when it comes to walk the walk, his character's not backing it up, and it's it's sad that, that that's what happened. I'm so glad that Bray Wyatt now, you know, is getting a lot of wins with Matt Hardy, um, but getting back to NXT TakeOver here, so hopefully um, Velveteen Dream picks up his next win, and uh, what can I say? I just hope they don't screw these guys up on the main roster, right? <laughs> because these two have great potential, I think, to do some really cool uh, things out there with the likes of Daniel Bryan, AJ Styles, you know, Nakamura, you know, just all those guys on the main roster. Disclaimer, the following audio was recorded before Sanity made their debut on SmackDown two nights later. Please enjoy the rest of this audio review. Alright, next up we have a match that I was looking forward to very much, which was for the NXT Women's Championship with Shayna Baszler defending the title against Nikki Cross, who at this moment has been pretty much been the only is no not pretty much is the only sanity member we have seen on wwe programming because uh, as the reports go they called up sanity and had no direction for them so they just been missing they haven't been on tv not nxt or wwe's main programming of raw and smackdown and uh, if anybody knows me, you know, if you're going to bring these guys up, have a purpose. Don't just bring them up for the sake of, oh, we got them, but we don't know what to do with them. So just sit backstage and, and don't do anything. Uh, but anyways, uh, anyway, yeah, I am a fan of Nikki Cross, and uh, I I was cheering for Nikki Cross. I knew obviously Shayna Baszler was gonna win, but I thought just for the fun of it, um, why not? It'd be really cool to see Nikki Cross, and the crowd was definitely hot for Nikki Cross to go ahead and win the women's championship here. And uh, Shayna Baszler, she was getting legit boo, which is good because hey, she should be getting booed. She's a heel, and that was really cool to see. Um, the story of this match was really interesting I did like the build up to it with uh, Nikki uh, Cross basically being so crazy you know everybody's fearing Shayna's bullying her way all through the locker room but Nikki's not afraid of her because she's just this psychopath and therefore it ended up freaking uh, Shayna Baszler out because she's dealing with someone who she can't intimidate and she's like wow you know how do you, how do you deal with this person it's really cool um, so that was pretty much what you got here at the beginning of the match with Nikki Cross just getting into the mind of Shayna Baszler and she was doing all wacky stuff like uh, uh, just making a bunch of strange, crazy faces. Uh, she even got on all four at one point, and uh, it was just like just really crazy stuff. It was freaking Shayna Bra Baszler out. Um, but of course, uh, as it got through the match, Shayna Baszler kept hitting Nikki Cross with a lot of hard hitting stuff, and Nikki kept coming back. And Nikki even got some close f near falls in there, and Shayna had to get her foot on the rope. So uh, it was really cool. Uh, you could tell the crowd. I don't think the crowd was this match or the next match they were kind of dying down but look what the heck they had to follow those like the first match and the in the second match wow <laughs> but uh nonetheless uh the crowd definitely still wanted uh nikki cross to win i was cheering for nikki cross um and towards the end of the match what ends up happening is Shayna ends up getting nikki cross into the chokehold and nikki cross is trying her best to fight out now from my perspective uh i i i couldn't tell what was going on i, I was like she's not gonna tap out and then next thing you know she passes out and it's over I'm like holy crap what happened um now i guess i like i said i still have to uh go back and watch it on tv but i heard that nikki cross was smiling before she ended up passing out so if that's the case uh, a good way to protect nikki cross and i'm glad that you know i would have much preferred that with charlotte uh and and you know oscar at least they didn't have her tap in several in just a few seconds like they had oscar tap out to charlotte so this was a legit good way you keep base are strong by keeping the NXT women's title on her and you make Nikki Cross look strong uh, by never giving up and passing out and uh, maybe she'll be on to the main roster and will debut with Sanity because I didn't really see the purpose in that I don't even know what the purpose was bringing them up in the first place <laughs> but uh, that said uh, it was a decent match I would say honestly though um, if I had to say what was my least favorite match it would probably be this on the card and when I say least 
least favorite match on NXT, you know, that just means it was okay, it wasn't, it wasn't anything that blew me out of the park or anything, or blew me out of the water, um, or something like that, but it just means, um, because even in NXT, if, if, if something's not, it, it's just okay, but I can't say it was horrible, or there's nothing like that, yeah, uh, so let's move on to the next match here, the NXT Championship, which featured Aleister Black defending the championship against Lars Sullivan. Uh, Lars Sullivan is interesting since I haven't been able to see, like I said, I haven't seen as much of his work, um, but um, it seemed to. F I'm guessing I'm starting to hear mixed reviews on him. I, I, from my understanding, some people feel like he's he's good, but he's not anything extraordinary, but he's not horrible. It seems the general, I guess that's more like it, the general consensus on the guy is that he's uh, okay um, for a big guy. Uh, and honestly, uh, I've got really no big problem with him. Um, I think uh, definitely he plays to his strengths. Um, and in this match... Um, the crowd, like I said, really, maybe they were preserving their energy for, um, maybe they were preserving their energy for, uh, Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano, which we'll get to that in, in, uh, in a moment, uh, but this match here, uh, I know the guy next to me in the crowd, he, uh, he's, he didn't care about, he didn't care for this match, he was just ready to get to the main event, um, but overall, uh, fans definitely, uh, did love of the entrance once again great seeing that live there and the match itself seemed to be where Lars Sullivan took control he was doing a lot of uh power slams or is that his move that's called the um what was that move is that the move that he has that's I think is called the what was it the freak accident I think it is I think that's what it is for those of you who follow NXT on a regular basis please uh, correct me in the comments uh, but that being said uh, what we had here is it just basically Lars Sullivan punishing um, Alistair Black you know he hit a lot of those power slams or the uh, freak accidents even one on the uh, side of the ring which as we all know WWE always likes to tell us is the hardest uh, part of the ring so yeah and this of course was going to build up to Alistair Black making the big baby face comeback and uh, he definitely started getting back in this he kept trying to nail the um he kept trying to nail the black mask, what's it called, the, yeah, the black mask kick uh, on him, uh, but Lars Sullivan kept powering out of it, and eventually, now from my perspective, uh, from where I saw it in the arena, uh, it looked like it didn't connect. And I eventually did get to see the clip back, and I look on the TV, and yeah, you saw from the from the side view, it did not connect at all. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I started wondering because when he pinned him, and after he kicked out, the fans started chanting "You effed up, you effed up, you effed up," and um, I was like, oh, there must have been a that probably it looked like a botch and everything because when you're in front of it, you know, you don't really see it. Like you know, when they shoot it in movies, you know, like they might show it where the guy punches or kicks him near the face and from that perspective it looks pretty decent but if you view it from the side you're like oh my they, they did not touch at all um looking back on that botch uh which is very unfortunate that it had to happen um I, I'll look at it from this perspective. Uh, Lars Sullivan's back was turned, so Aleister Black probably should have waited for Lars Sullivan to turn around so that he can make better impact. And Lars Sullivan, from his perspective, uh, he shouldn't have probably sold that, right? Because, I mean, uh, yeah, he probably just heard him go ahead and smack his uh, thigh, th that sound effect they use for the uh, super kicks, and he just chose to sold it anyways, which is probably going to make its way into Botchamania, I'm pretty sure has already made its way into Botchamania and will live on throughout the internet's time. Uh, so yeah, it is, it's really unfortunate. Uh, you know, it would have probably been better if maybe they could have, Lars Sullivan saw it, didn't hit, and they just played it off like he missed it and maybe punch him in the gut and that took that time to yell try it over again, but hey, when you're in there, uh, you know, things happen even with the professionals, things happen. You're moving so fast, you, you probably 
thinking, oh, crap, let me just go ahead and sell anyway, you know, and then it's not until you're able to look back and go like, dang it, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, it reminds me of that stutter step the referee did back in TNA when, uh, what was that, Bob, I know we talked about it before in some of these reviews when, uh, what was it, Bobby Roode, uh, foot was supposed to hit the referee, but it didn't, and they still sold it anyway, or most recently, the greatest Royal Rumble when Jinder Mahal sold the, what was it, the Whisper in the Wind, um, or Whisper of the Wind, I forget what it was called, with Jeff Hardy, uh, yeah, um, that saying though, the ending of the match I did enjoy where Lars Sullivan was finally nailed with the black mask, went down to his knees, and then he got another black mask where, uh, Aleister Black picks up the win, um, probably wasn't, obviously, definitely not the best, yeah, it's not the best NXT championship match we've seen, especially, uh, from January with Andrade Cien Amis and Johnny Gargano, but, uh, uh, hey, it is what it is. Um, hopefully, Aleister Black gets a chance to main event one of these takeover shows because with the way this main event looks, looks like it's not gonna be. It's gonna be the same case for him uh, when we head towards. NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. That being said, let's get to the main event. A Chicago street fight between Johnny Gargano and Tomasa Ciampa. Wow, that's what I've got to say. Uh, they experienced this match in person. You know, I like their match going back to the Cruiserweight Classic and then the first match of this feud um, that we got, that this year-long feud uh, that started, ironically, in the same building at the Allstate Arena. And the the first match, definitely, I think I may have said last time, I thought there was a parts where it was a little slow in areas, and I thought I said I would have took it down a little bit, but it was still overall a great match, and I did get the chance to view that match again, and I really did enjoy it. Uh, but that being said, uh, I take nothing away from the first match, but I definitely like the second match better. I thought the second match was 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 complete action from, <laughs> I was there live, I saw it. it was it was action from pretty much start to about nearly the finish when it started slowing down to kind of tell the story towards the end, uh, but overall I, I love the match, I mean these guys got off to a hot start let me just say the, the entrances it was really cool, they actually do hand out those uh, papers as we were walking through the lobby, they handed out said whether you want to cheer for uh, Johnny Gargano or Tomasa Ciampa um you know where they have like either their logos on either on either side so uh they have all that holding out so yeah they do hand those out uh, like when you would see like uh you would say like Cesaro section and stuff yeah they hand all those out at the events uh so I can confirm that for those of you that always wondered uh that being said uh crowd obviously loved uh Johnny Gargano and when Tomasa Ciampa came out uh or is it Ciampa I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing when Tommaso Ciampa came came out there was no music but man the crowd heat you heard the boos raining in but it was so much different than what you get with Roman Reigns like you got these same type of boos for Roman but here the uh, Tommaso Ch uh, Ciampa <laughs> is presented as a uh is a heel so the babyface and heel dynamic definitely still can work in 2018 ladies and gentlemen it definitely can still work that's not a problem problem at all you just gotta have you know characters that fans are emotionally invested in and this is what I love so much about professional wrestling when you've got two characters that you can get invested into you've got a great storyline to get you invested into and it goes into this match and everything just all all the pieces fall into place man this this is why I know all of us love wrestling professional wrestling so much because when you got great stuff like this yeah these guys went at it, uh, you know, slashing weapons everywhere, trash cans, beating the crap out of each other, they went into the crowd brawling, they even, um, below the section, I was in the, um, upper deck section, so they were, like, 30 feet away from at least our viewpoint, so we were like, oh, man, I was telling the people next to me, like, we got the, let's say, in this particular portion, we got the best seats in the house, uh, yeah, they were fighting everywhere, you had so many cool stuff from, like, um, them pulling out the, um, trash cans and, um, running each other into it, uh, um, just so like I said, I'm just going off my initial thoughts here. So sorry if I'm missing some spots. I'm I'm just trying to remember. Uh, there's part where um. 
Tommaso uh, ended up ripping the uh, ring apart. So, you know, for a lot of people out there, you know, uh, we know, yes, wrestling is choreographed, scripted, and improvised, but uh, the risk these men and women take is legit and that ring is definitely made out of what two percent matting steel with wood and steel right underneath it yeah their bodies takes a beating and i knew that this was going to be a huge factor into this match they kind of went away from it because they want you to forget about it but i knew all along they were going to go back to that. that's why we why when um there's a part where they actually uh ended up going back but before that i think there was a part where um there's a spot where you see tomaso Champa, uh, Champa is really trying to get his revenge from the last match where he puts Gargano in his own, uh, what was it, the uh, Gargano escape, uh, no escaper was it, and uh, he's cranking back on him with the... Um, with what is it his uh with his knee his knee brace and everything so i thought that was a really cool spot and call back and that's what i really love about rematches when they call they do things and where they call back to what happened in the first match and uh it doesn't happen and and it, they basically come up with it as a new spot to keep things fresh from match to match so that was pretty cool uh I'm trying to think what else happened in this match um that was awesome um <laughs> there's a part where johnny gargano took his belt off and was whooping the crap out of it. I was in the I was in the crowd yelling, "By God, by God, he's whooping him like a government mule!" Uh, like I said, I know I do a horrible Jim Ross impression, but man, you knew if uh, Jim Ross was on commentary uh, going all out, that's exactly what he'd be saying. It was so uh, hilarious because you're hearing the crowd go like, "You deserve it." You deserve it. <laughs> you know, all that stuff. That was pretty cool. Um, so there is a part. So they eventually... Um they eventually end up going nor near the set, and they get on like you know one of those uh what is it like loading docks I think they're called or, or something like that whatever you know it's the stuff that they use to build the sets up, and they're on there, and this got me booing because oh my gosh, but it was such tremendous heel work. There's a part where Tommaso Ciampa takes off uh obviously it's not his real wedding ring Johnny Gargano, which I forgot to mention uh before this as Johnny was walking to the stage. His wife Candace, Candace LeRae comes up and uh, hands him like the broken crutch or something like that, and she's like, "Kick his ass!" And man, that's exactly how everybody was so pumped up, ready for this fight. And you know, um, so yeah, he actually takes off the wedding ring and throws it and the fans man the booze came in raining and that was just a tremendous heel move i was booing um <laughs> and after that you know this is what gets uh johnny gargano fired up and he launches tomaso ciampa grabs him and launches him straight down to through two tables uh and of course the fans wanted tables and we got it there and uh this is what ends up calling everybody to just try and uh get him out the match because because they're, all the officials come out and the EMTs and they're going to try and take uh, Tommaso Ciampa away on the stretcher. And you got Johnny Gargano uh, just sitting there looking, uh, you know, like, it, has it come to this? Is this where it all had to come at? You know, I mean, is, is this where it, it all had to come down to, you know? Uh, you know, because they were once best friends. So, they're, you know, just playing up the emotion. Kind of similar to what they did in the last match. Um, now, like I said, uh, from my perspective, they're way far from us at this time because they're near the stage so I didn't see exactly what happened once again I didn't watch it I've yet to watch it back on the WWE Network so correct me if I'm wrong but I believe what ends up happening is Johnny Gargano looks down and notices that his ring his wedding ring is not on his finger and he then puts two and two together realize oh this no good SOB took my wedding ring off and threw it somewhere and you know that gets up he's ready to make him pay so he gets up and he takes Tommaso Ciampa brings him back down to the ring while he's stretching to the gurney now I'm actually in the crowd yelling at this point he probably didn't hear me getting everything because <laughs> I'm at the upper deck but I'm yelling I'm like leave him I'm like leave him bound to the stretcher you've got this one he's defenseless but he ends up taking him off the stretcher throws him in there and instead takes the um 
he takes the, uh, what's that called? He takes the, uh, from the, um, the handcuffs that, uh, Champa took out earlier, and he ends up, uh, using that as a way to, uh, to, uh, handcuff, uh, Champa together, and you know it's gonna get, it's gonna get messed up here. Uh, I should have mentioned, too, when, um, Johnny was knocking out, like, a, he was knocking out officials left and right, he also knocked the referee out, so Johnny actually did get the, uh, Gargano escape on, um, the Gargano Gargano escape on it, um, on Tommaso, and he was tapping out, but there's no referee, because of course, with WWE logic, as often the case is sometimes, when the babyface has the match won, the referee is knocked out, but when the heel gets a win, all of a sudden the referee's up and has energy out of nowhere. Okay, though I did enjoy back in the Attitude Era those dramatic uh, three counts that my all-time favorite referee Earl Hebner would do with Jim Ross calling on the commentary as the referee slowly does the one and the Jim Ross is all like, not this way, by God, not this way, not this way, you know, oh man, um... That being said, uh, so the ending of this match comes into play, and I knew, like I said, I knew they were going to get back into the ring because right there is where you had the um, you had the uh, the exposed part of the ring, and you have all these officials coming in trying to break up the match, and it's a street fight, and everybody's booing, and Johnny Gargano's going crazy. He's knocking dudes out left and right. All these officials are going down one by one. It's like um, <laughs> you guys remember back in the um, the invasion, Invasion, early part of the invasion when Stone Cold Steve Austin came in and he just started knocking dudes out left and right before he started landing stunners on all the invasion stuff. That's pretty much what it reminded me of. It was like that. However, the distractions end up being too much for one Johnny Gargano as Tommaso Ciampa, when he's trying to get in the ring, you know, he has no, uh, he's handcuffed, but he's able to get to my, he's able to get Johnny's head through his arms and lands the DDT, kind of like the, the DDT, the rope DDT that, uh, um, that uh, Randy Orton does. Uh, he lands something like that onto the exposed wood of the ring, and Johnny sold this as he's knocked out, as it should be. With with that's that was the big spot. This is what everything was building up towards in the match. And Tommaso Ciampa gets the win. One, two, three. And, um, yeah, it looks like this feud is going to continue. I figured this would happen, and I'm fine with it. Um, I'm hoping that maybe we get our first ever Hell in the Cell match in NXT for NXT Brooklyn 2. Um, and I know Hell in a Cell matches, uh, sometimes they've been hit and miss. You know, you get some, uh, pretty decent ones, um, with some cool spots, and then you get ones, um, that are kind of like, this is just a glorified hardcore match with a cell over it, and it's like, you could have just made this a street fight and would have been good, right? <laughs> um, but that said, the uh, I think uh, under Triple H and his NXT crew's vision, uh, a Hell in a Cell match I think could actually work in NXT. Um, that being said, I am okay with this finish. And of course, I, I don't know if they showed it on the network, uh, but obviously all the crowds in attendance saw Candice LeRae come out there to comfort her husband. And uh, you had to Muscle Champa basically just giving the signal of bye bye uh, to them. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's how it goes, you know, I was in the crowd like, oh, that's some BS, you know, not BS as in like the way they booked it, but BS in the storyline, because like I said, it captures you into the storyline, it, and like it's BS, they had all these officials getting in the way of Johnny and all that stuff, uh, but man, this match was incredible, and definitely I think the match of the night, and man, just overall, I... I enjoyed NXT TakeOver Chicago too. This was really awesome, awesome show. And obviously Money in the Bank would have some big shoes to uh, feel after this uh, show. But yeah, I had a great time in Chicago. Uh, NXT, it's always amazing to uh, be a part of that crowd. And <laughs> I wanted to say there's one part during the, I didn't mention, um, during the Shayna Baszler and... Uh, Nikki cross match there's a point where I saw it I don't know if it was on TV but they uh somebody tries to uh go ahead and they took a um they took a beach ball out and started to get a beach ball and the ref the security quickly got a hold of it ripped it apart and the fans were booing and Chan F beat like uh F you beach ball F you beach ball 
F you beach ball. And I think somebody even tried to get a CM Punk chant um, going. And the fans there are booing. And keep in mind, this is the Chicago crowd that came all the way to Rosemont, Illinois. Uh, well, not all the way. It's not that far. But came to Rosemont, Illinois. Nonetheless, at the Allstate Arena. And that's when it really dawned on me, man. I, I was happy because you the, these crowds, the NXT crowd, they really respect. It shows you how well Triple H and everyone involved with the NXT product has done um, at getting at getting you so invested that the fans really respect the entire show. They want to see the show. Even if, you know, like I said, they weren't as um, hot for this match as um, as some of like the other, like the first two or even the main event, but they still want to give, even if it's a, show, a match they're not hot for, they still want to give it that respect. Now, obviously, this would be a different story come Money in the Bank with Roman Reigns and Jinder Mahal where you get the crowd wanting to hijack but yeah it was really cool you see the crowd really is invested and they really want to respect and be into the product into the characters into the matches and that's what really makes everything uh so awesome about just being at these nxt shows so that said guys i hope you enjoyed my review for nxt takeover chicago 2 and i will be back with the money and the bank 2018 review and hopefully i will have some guests like the man triple zero one and maybe uh who knows steve-o or maybe we'll have our friends smp come back uh but yeah definitely i will be back with guests uh for the money in the bank 2018 review that said here are my plugs so if you obviously are a fan of wwe or professional wrestling we'll be doing more audio reviews like this for big events that you can listen to as you go about your everyday life also if you're a fan of Dragon Ball, Shonen Manga, or anime adapted from Shonen Manga, make sure to check out my upcoming short film, Battle of Deception, as it's based on those types of genres. I currently have lots of videos such as the teaser trailer and the behind the scene interview videos right here on my channel, so make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can be notified as soon as I release more content regarding Battle of Deception, Dragon Ball, and even WWE. And make sure to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter and Instagram, both at Sungoshoku. All links will be in the description below. Take care!